Kathleen. I'm very pleased to announce this wonderful meeting today. We have Steve Lancaster Hall from Deloitte and Touche. Very, um, very excited to hear about their 2020 Human Capital Trends Annual Report and the KM factors of that. So very, very excited. Let me, um, let me just hand it off to Steve. Thank you, Steve. Well, thank you everyone for having me today. Um, Steve Lancaster, I lead our consulting services for Deloitte and I serve our clients on the KM side. Uh, I have a team that worked with me about a about hundred people. Um, a, a good portion of them sit in our Israel practice. Um, and the, then, so we combine our Israel practice with, with the U.S. to serve our clients. Um, and it's a, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity to be with you today. Um, there's a lot that we are going to talk about today that, is, uh, that touches on, that not only directly addresses knowledge management, but um, as we have all learned uh, since the pandemic, the concept of virtual work has become an important concept and uh, how knowledge management helps uh, provide productivity to our employees, help them stay connected to the organization, and help make the, uh, the invisible visible to them in doing their work. Um, those are some of the things that we're going to talk about today. So I, I thought I'd start by, um, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Deloitte Human Capital Trends Report. It's a significant investment that the firm makes every single year. Um, this year, no different. Uh, it's a global report. We've had you know, over 20,000 uh, uh, people who have contributed to it in terms of, of our research. Uh, and then we have a global team that works on refining that research into the top nine trends. Um, this year, we're calling our, our trends report the social enterprise at work, which is continuing the theme um, around the social enterprise that we started last year. Two things I really kind of want to point out on this before we move forward. The first is around the concept of the social enterprise, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but I thought that I would just ground us on a definition. Uh, the social enterprise, as we look at it, is an organization whose mission is combined uh, revenue growth and profit making with the need to respect and support its environment and its stakeholder community. In terms of the imagery on this slide, I, I, think, it's I think it's interesting the way that we do this. Um, the dark outside represents a world that's purely technological. What's inside the circle is bright, and it's the blending of technology and humanity together. In the last two years, we've incorporated this, this vision of a head somewhere on, in our human capital trends, uh, and we've kept that trend this year. As you can see, the white outline here represents the head and the nose, and the couch that's in the middle of the picture is an eye. So the idea here is that we're bringing the human focus forward in the context of a social enterprise. So um, we start with the first slide, which is really the definition of what uh, paradox is. Uh, paradox is a situation um, where a person or thing combines contradictory features or qualities. In this year's report, we're focused on what we believe is the most pressing paradox facing organizations today. Which is, can organizations remain distinctly human in a technology-driven world? And the question is, how do we get to this paradox? How do we get to this point? Well, let's go back through the past decade and reflect on what's happened from the early part of the decade to the mid part of the decade to the late de decade. Um, there's been a series of events that have fundamentally changed the world around us. Everything from when we enter the decade when, when we're recovering from the recession to then seeing an influx of revolutionary technologies from clouds to drones to AI. This explosion of data that was at our fingertips and at the same time, organizations were rethinking jobs and redesigning work. And when we look at all those events at what's been happening, we see that we're forming two distinct tracks. Those two distinct forces have impacted organizations in a very significant way over the past decade. A focus on humans and a focus on technology. From our observation, those forces have been at odds with one another. And one that has done, and, and what that has done 
is it's created a series of conflicts for organizations uh, that they struggle with. The first conflict is between belonging and individuality. How do you foster a sense of belonging amid this desire for individuality? Technology creates the ability for everything to be personalized and individualized, but humans still desire the sense of connection. And this needs to be belonging in a, in a bigger vision. So how do you combine those two distinct forces? The next conflict that we've seen arises between security and reinvention. Technology creates this need for constant reinvention, but humans desire a sense of security. So how do you create that sense of security amidst continual reinvention? And then the third conflict that we see emerge is between boldness and uncertainty. Technology creates an environment that is truly uncertain. Whatever can change inevitably will, and we're seeing that now in spades. With the pandemic we're going through, humans desire to take bold moves. So how do you turn that uncertainty into a perspective that will allow for these bold moves? And so the question these conflicts raise is, will the paradox remain unresolved or can we find a path forward? We believe that we can carve a path forward and have determined how. So let's talk about each of these three conflicts that I set up earlier. The first is belonging and individuality. So in order to resolve this conflict, what we want to ask ourselves is, what if instead of creating divisions, individuality could become a source of strength, born of bringing together unique complementary abilities in the pursuit of shared goals? When we do that, we truly em embrace purpose. An organization that embraces purpose is one that doesn't just talk about purpose, but embeds meaning into every aspect of, every, of work every single day. And a lot of organizations talk about the fact that they're embracing purpose. But we see in different organizations that they're doing today what it would truly mean to embed purpose into your DNA tomorrow. Because today we see a lot of organizations using mission statements and values to create connection, but a fairly high level connection between the organization and the workforce. When organizations truly embody purpose, they're deepening that connection because they know extending it to the team, to the individual, and to the work is being done every day. When we talk about our trends chapters, there are three trends that we believe will help organizations embody purpose, which are belonging, designing for well being, and the post generational workforce. The second conflict that we've mentioned is this idea of, about bridging the gap between security and reinvention. With regard to that conflict, we ask, our, ask ourselves, what if instead of being perceived as a threat, reinvention could become the means of finding security in the midst of ongoing change? And we define that as potential. An organization that truly embraces potential is one that is designed and organized to maximize what humans are capable of thinking, creating, and doing in the world of machines. And when you think about the difference between how organizations work today and how we believe they should work tomorrow when they embrace potential, today organizations anchor their workforce strategies on what is known about their workforce, what each worker has demonstrated they can do and have done, what might appear on their resume, if you will. But when an organization truly embraces potential, they're establishing forward-looking workforce strategies. They're creating opportunities based on what workers are capable of doing and simultaneously developing workers' cap capacity to contribute in new ways. And the way that we think that we could bring potential to life is through this concept of super teams, knowledge management, and looking beyond reskilling. And we're gonna talk about each of those trends in a moment. The last conflict that we've talked about is one that exists between boldness and uncertainty. And with regard to that conflict, we wanna ask ourselves, what if instead of prompting doubt, uncertainty could give rise to new possibilities? The opportunity to shape the future through decisive action. And we call that perspective. An organization that embraces perspective is one that encourages and embraces future orientation. Asking not just how to optimize for today, but how they can create value tomorrow. And what we see in that is the current moment, organizations are focused on the here and now. They're making decisions about today, especially in the context of this pandemic. Tomorrow, organizations are going to expand that focus towards the future, 
they're still going to address the urgent needs of today, but they need to look forward to the future as they do that. And they can increase their confidence to take bold action. And we're gonna be exploring how organizations can take that future orientation on a few different topics. Compensation, ethics, and how they can use that future orientation to develop new ways of governing work and work strategies for moving forward. So when we look at these three attributes that we've talked about, purpose, potential, and perspective, we believe that these attributes represent the DNA of the social enterprise at work. We use the word DNA because it's about embedding these attributes into the way that our organizations are working, embedding them into the fabric of the culture. They become the part of the way that you're operating and therefore they infiltrate all the programs and processes and policies and procedures that govern your workforce. So let's start with purpose. Purpose is all about how we bring meaning to work, how we take something that is personal and translate that into organizational value. At the summary level, that is what purpose is about. Our first trend, belonging, is titled from comfort to connection to contribution. Most organizations said that they spend their efforts focusing on belonging by creating comfort, allowing people to feel secure in the organization. And sometimes people say the ability to bring your authentic self to work is this a sense of comfort. I can be who I want to be at work. I can feel safe with who I am. And that's how we define comfort. What we found though is that while comfort is incredibly important, organizations need to do more than just create a sense of comfort in order to really translate belonging into organizational performance. They also need to foster a strong connection as a team and they need to create a tighter link between an individual's contribution and the organization's purpose. So that's the move from comfort to connection to contribution. First, let me give you a couple of the statistics. I'll say that there are actually two, that, that the number two trend this year was belonging. The number one trend is the next one after this, and you're gonna hear about which is well-being. So I think what we're really interested in is that well-being and belonging were the number one and number two trends, and I'll say that, that was a huge surprise for us. If you think about prior years, the number one trends have been things like learning, organizational design, and so all of a sudden for it to be about well-being and belonging, I think really signals that the human side is really becoming so incredibly important for organizations. 79% of our survey respondents said that fostering a sense of belonging was important to their organization's success in the next 12 to 18 months. In the report, we talked about a few key reasons why organizations said belonging was important. First of all, you know, this focus on populism or nationalism is really taking hold externally and driving this need to have a sense of belonging. That was one reason we cited. The other thing we said was the workforce itself is changing. We're seeing a greater portion of the workforce be the alternative workforce. That segment of the workforce really in a lot of ways doesn't feel like they belong. So that may be fostering this drive towards belonging becoming more important. And then you have this move towards virtual work. People aren't face to face as much. So people are craving the sense of belonging and you're working in a virtual remote way. Work is where people are spending a lot of their time. So if you're spending a lot of your time doing work, you wanna feel like you belong to that organization and have a strong sense of connection to that organization. What we found in the next statistic is on this slide is that 93% of respondents agree that a sense of belonging drives organizational performance. This is actually one of the highest rates of consensus that we've seen in a decade of human capital trends. So there's this view that belonging really drives organizational performance and therefore is incredibly important. And yet only 13% say that they are very ready to address this trend, which raises the question, how can we define belonging in a way that maximizes impact for both employee and organizations? And that leads us to breaking this three-tier definition of comfort, connection, and contribution. The survey results validate the importance of all three of these factors. The lowest number of our respondents said that the attributes related to comfort were critical in driving organizational performance. It was actually as you moved up towards connection and then to contribution that we saw respondents start to say that this is how you drive organizational performance. And so it became clear that we can't just focus on comfort alone, but that we need to focus on ways in which we could create higher connection to the team itself. And the team constructs, constructs ways to become incredibly important and belong in a way that values the individual and their contributions become important here. 
So when we talk about our solution, we say that there are three major factors we needed to be able to drive belonging. One is a focus on culture. Your culture needs to reinforce a sense of belonging. The second is on leadership. We actually brought in some of the findings from As One. Many of you may be familiar with the As One from a, a, probably about a billion years ago, but as we leveraged As One to talk about some of the leadership models that we've seen, um, these are the most effective in creating connection between the individual and the team. And then we talk about personal relationships and how you can use those personal relationships to establish a greater sense of connection and to really honor an individual's contribution to the organization. One of the leading examples that we used here is from NASA, who I think is really ultimately um, ultimate in establishing contribution and belonging. And what's interesting about NASA is that three quarters of their workforce are actually the alternative workforce. So it seems contradictory to think that NASA would be able to have and foster such a high a degree of belonging. They've been able to do this by tying every individual's work and contribution ultimately to their mission. So they've created the ability to have meaning at work for every single one of their employees. And that's how they've established a sense of contribution and how they've created connection to the team. And ultimately, I think a big part of that is because everyone feels comfortable in the work environment. 80% of our respondents to this year's Global Human Capital Trends survey identified well-being as an important part of our human priority for the organization's success, making it this year's top trend for importance. This year, we're talking about how to design well-being into the work itself so that workers not only feel their best, but perform their best. This year's trend is not about well-being programs that we've talked about for decades, such as benefits and perks. Those are nice to have, but the trend here is really focused on incorporating well-being into the work. It's moving away from just talking about the program. When you talk about what matters, what causes stress, or what makes you happy or satisfied, it's the work itself. It's important to focus to have much better sense of ownership with the work and to understand how the work supports the organization and why it matters. HR leaders need to be more cautious to provide a full human experience to the worker through work design. They need to understand what matters to the workforce and this will help people feel more engaged in the work, which will make them feel more comfortable and more confident that they can perform their best and improve productivity. And then when they can relate to each other in this way, it builds a higher performing culture. When we did the survey, 80% of respondents said that worker well-being was very important. But if you look at what they've done or whether they know how to do it, the response was much lower. People are still sort of lagging behind, understanding how to incorporate the worker's needs into the work design itself. We're still thinking about what to provide around them. Organizations need to understand what workers are really finding the purpose and meaning in, whether people can maximize their potential and whether they understand how the organization wants them to contribute. Through our survey, we learned that fewer than half of the respondents are seeing impacts from the well being that extend beyond workforce experience. And when we asked our respondents, what impact are you getting from all this investment, all these millions, if not billions, of dollars we're investing in well being, what benefit is it giving? more than half of our respondents said that they're not seeing positive impacts to uh, the results of the business. However, when we asked about making an impact to customer strategy, is it making an impact to the execution of your business strategy? More than half of those respondents said also that it was not. We're making a lot of investments in well-being, but for most organizations, it's not doing anything other than impacting the workforce experience. It's not actually impacting the bottom line of things that impact our customers or our financial performance, and that's where well-being can be optimized. Microsoft is a great example of how you can design well-being into the work itself. Microsoft Japan has been moving from a five-day work week to a four-day work week, and they've been getting similar levels of output. This year, the World Health Organization actually made burnout a diagnosable health condition really putting well-being on the map not as an oh you know are you happy or are you not but it's turning into a diagnosable health condition so obviously it's becoming more and more important it does feel like it's paramount and that's exactly why it was the number one trend this year we have a, a workforce that is more complex than ever and in many of the large organizations the workforce now spans five generational categories 
We also have much more diversity of careers that cannot be described by just one demographic element, let alone by age. And when we looked at the generational divide, we found that organizational segments, their workforces, and then anchor their workforce programs and strategies by generation. As workforces become more complex, we have to begin looking at employees in more than just a traditional way and beyond demographic aspects of an individual. Instead, we need to look at their values, aspirations, attitudes, and characteristics, and then start to use this to actually understand the individual needs and understand the workforce at a deeper level. As a result, organizations can begin creating workforce programs for larger cohorts based on these unique characteristics. So let's have a look at the major statistics on the next slide. 70% of organizations say that leading multi-generational workforces is important for their success over the next 12 to 18 months. But at the same time, more than half of the respondents still use generation as the actual factor or segmentation to actually design and deliver workforce programs, which is a contradiction in itself again. Additionally, even worse than that is that only 10% of the respondents said that they are ready to actually lead multi-generational workforces, and let alone only 6% of their leaders are actually equipped and know how to lead multi-generational workforces effectively. Overall, we have the technology to segment workforces differently. We have the insights we can lean on to execute, and we have to apply the technology to effectively manage the workforce. To bring this together, we define purpose not just as talking about purpose, but embedding meaning into the individuals, the teams, and the work that's done. And as you think about these three trends, you know now belonging is about the move from comfort to connection to contribution, helping people feel meaning in their work so that they feel contributions are valued and they feel a true connection to the team to maximize their impact on organizational performance, which is a great way to bring purpose to life. Well-being, that's about taking something that's incredibly personal and tying it to something that's organizational making well-being meaningful because it's actually embedded into the work that's done every single day. It's another way to bring purpose to life. And then we have the post-generational workforce, this idea of understanding the workforce at a deeper level so that we can design work and all the programs that surround work with an eye towards the individual and who they are, what makes them unique versus categorizing it based on generation. And so all of those things are ways in which we can really help organizations embody purpose into their DNA. And that's how I'd summarize those, how these trends fit together. Now, again, we're gonna move to potential. And potential is very much about how we anchor workforce strategies from what is known about the workforce to and how they have the ability to do their work to the workforce capabilities that we might have seen demonstrated. But, that they have actually the ability to do if, if they're given the right circumstances. The, the first concept is around super teams. Five years ago, we wrote a trend on machines as talent. So for five years, we've been talking about the role that technology plays as part of the talent equation. We talked about automation. We've talked about cognitive technologies and we talked about AI. And this year, we're building on the last year's trend of super jobs and how technology is changing the jobs that we do. Today, exponential technologies are collapsing jobs, redesigning job categories so that we're doing work that is shared with technology. Part of our job is done by, the working tech, by working with technology, and part is doubling down on the work that we do that is particularly human. What we're trying to do this year is to bring together the redesign of jobs and the redefinition of work around how teams operate and how we put AI in the group. How do we put AI on the team? So much of our thinking around the role of robotics, in particular AI, is about what parts of the work AI can substitute for what people are doing. And then there's this phrase, which is, what work is left over? What's the remaining work for people to do? The core of redesigning jobs and redefining work for super teams is to think about current work, the current work outcomes, the work future outcomes, and then how you put technology on the team. As AI enters the workforce, the critical question is not whether it will affect jobs, but how. A question that is prompting an increasing amount of discussion about AI's role at work. Moving on to a few of our statistics found from this year's survey, 70% of the organizations in this year's survey said, we are using or exploring AI 
in using AI in jobs. But only 12% said that they are looking at AI to replace workers. 58% of organizations are telling us that they are using AI to focus on consistency and quality. Put another way, they're using it to do current work outcomes. In a way, they're focusing on either productivity, more of the same, or they're focusing on reducing error rates. The two numbers here are using AI, but only one out of six are using or actually reskilling their workforce to use technologies that create a, uh, which creates a disconnect. And only one out of six are using AI to actually generate insights or create new value. So part of what we're looking at in the super teams discussion is how technology and people work together. But a lot of the work that's going on right now in the initial thinking about AI is not about insights and value. It's about productivity and it's about quality error reduction. So this is part of the opportunity that we have when we're looking at the way AI and other technologies are being used and how teams can optimize the value that AI can bring to the work in their workforce. The second way that you put potential into practice is through knowledge management. And this is the first year that we've really acknowledged knowledge management and it's a perfect time to do so in our trends report. If we wanna anchor on potential, if we wanna give people the ability to extend their capabilities, then we need to give them that knowledge at their fingertips. Effective knowledge management helps you to connect people to knowledge in a way that, that helps them extend their capabilities. And that's ultimately what's going on to help embed potential into an organization. We have a tsunami of data where we have new technology and new knowledge that's provided the organizations every day at an unprecedented speed and volume. Knowledge is and will stay a competitive differentiator for organizations. And the question is more how you can master the amount and the almost overwhelming refreshment of knowledge that comes in every day. A second driver for this trend is actually that we see an increase in worker mobility. You see many more people than in the past moving from jobs to jobs, from projects to projects, and within and outside an organization. Your organization and your organizational knowledge walks out the door. So what do you do about this? How can you actually make sure that this knowledge stays with you? At the same time as we see this development, we're starting to have more and more technology that actually allows us to capture knowledge in a better way. It might not be the traditional solutions that we know. And the question is, how do we leverage this to actually make knowledge management more meaningful and more effective? It's the first year that we have knowledge management as a single trend. And we, and we used to talk a lot about learning, but if you take a step back and look at the fundamentals of everything, you need to look at knowledge first before you can look at learning. Now is a perfect time to look at knowledge management and on a deeper level, because if you want to anchor on potential, then you really have to give people the ability to be in connection with the right knowledge at the right time. It's not just about documenting cold knowledge somewhere in a repository, but it's more about putting it in context. You need to make sure that knowledge, you need to make sure that you understand where you can find knowledge when you need it and how to connect this and also to other bordering or interfacing questions. To connect people and knowledge, you have to go beyond silos, team borders and functional borders. And this creates a very different piece around the culture that you need and AI around knowledge sharing because knowledge can't sit in only one team. Organizations who are good at doing this really create a culture that recognizes the value of knowledge sharing and that also maximizes human potential at work. Because if an individual has the ability to tap into knowledge wherever they need it, they can reinvent themselves and they will ultimately have more security in what they're able to do. This is the paradox of security and reinvention that is always asked for by the technology advancements. Creating context for a connected world. This is really the key piece. You need to contextualize knowledge. You need to enable people to tap into it whenever they need it so that they can reinvent themselves and live up to their potential. So of course, 75% say that's important. We need to create and preserve knowledge across evolving workforces. So they're very aware that they need to capture knowledge and that they need to do this for their success over the next 12 to eight months, 18 months. However, at the same time, 
55% of our respondents say they, they're still looking at knowledge management more as simply documenting and disseminating knowledge. But this is that cold knowledge. It's not really useful because it just sits somewhere. But nobody has created the culture that you're able to and that you're allowed to access it from across team silos. Only 67% of our actual respondents incorporate um, AI into knowledge management strategy. But this is actually one of the best fields to apply AI to. It and gives you the ability to contextualize the knowledge into your task or your job. Which brings us to the question at this point, are organizations fully taking advantage of the opportunity to create knowledge through people and machines? This is a hot topic that we talk about in the context of COVID-19 with so much remote work and knowledge going in and out. As work has become more virtual and more permanently virtual, making the invisible visible is an important part of driving employee productivity. So let's talk about beyond reskilling. The first sentence in this chapter says, reskilling alone may be a strategic dead end. Now we have a lot of clients that are out there in a lot of organizations, including ours, that are investing in massive amounts of money into reskilling. But what we found in our survey was that the vast majority of organizations have no idea what the skills of the future are going to be. And with shorter shelf life of skills, it feels like organizations are left forever catching up to fill the skills gap. So we offer an alternative, which is to focus on the resilience of workers by enabling workers with core capabilities to reinvent themselves, to adapt to the changing skill demands of the future. It's all anchored in this idea of if you really embody and embrace potential, then you're not just focused on what a person has done, you're focused on what they're capable of and what they have the ability to do. And that fundamentally changes really everything about your organization. It changes day-to-day -day activities. For example, what does recruiting for potential look like? How do you embed this into performance management? How do you reward people based on their ability to reskill and adapt? In our, in our survey, we found 55, 53% of our respondents believe that workforce is going to shift pretty dramatically in the next three years in terms of the skills and capabilities needed. But only 17% actually feel they can anticipate what those skills might be, and only 16% of the organizations uh, make this see any making any significant investments or increasing investments in this area over the next three years. In fact, the gap is particularly telling when it comes to AI, which we know is one of those great areas that's going to put the greatest pressure on needing to change or upgrade the skills and capabilities of our people. This raises the question, are organization efforts on reskilling aligned to the extent of the challenge that is in front of us? The last section here is around perspective. Um, embracing perspective enables organizations to align their workforce under a North Star, by which they can make bold decisions in environments of persistent change. To lead in this, organizations should first establish a set of principles rooted in an organization's values and future vision, which will guide critical workforce and organizational decisions. These principles should cover a broad range of questions such as how to reward workers and how to handle ethical challenges at the intersection of humans and technology. Putting these principles into action will involve taking data-driven approaches, as well as asking new questions and exploring new frameworks to manage human capital opportunities and risks. If you think back over the last decade of trends reports, there's a thread here that, that Deloitte's done where we've been talking about this for a while. The first was the tremendous amount of disruption and innovation that happened in the world of performance management. Then in the last few years, we've been talking more specifically about rewards and how organizations approach rewards. This year, we focus specifically on this question of compensation, and we're calling it the compensation conundrum, like a puzzle. We're not recommending a specific compensation structure, but we're recommending shifting the questions we ask of ourselves to make this, pro this prospect more fundamentally human. So what does that mean? Well, let's start by understanding why compensation continues to be such a conundrum for organizations. Salaries and wages account for up to 70% of an organization's total cost. Yet, our survey data shows that organizations seem remarkably unsure of how best to approach it for a number of reasons. Two of these major reasons include the dynamic nature of work 
and increase pressure for transparency in this area. At the social level, organizational level, and individual workforce level, we're feeling the pressure to do something different about compensation. To that effect, 56% of our respondents say that they have re redesigned their compensation strategy in the past three years, and 64% plan to redesign it yet again. So the key question remains, are we approaching the design of compensation correctly, or will we continue to be caught in the compensation conundrum? We need to stop treating compensation as a spot market, where we use it to address the short-term immediate issues, such as attracting top talent and keeping our best people. We need to get off this hamster wheel and start to design compensation with our humans in mind. And that's done by changing the questions that we ask ourselves when designing compensation programs. The new questions we ask ourselves to be focused on purpose and meaning, transparency and openness, ethics and fairness, growth and passion, collaboration and personal relationships. The end results will be a compensation strategy which improves the organization's ability to accomplish its objectives while meeting stakeholder needs and expectations in a much more transparent way. The chapter on governing workforce strategies uh, focuses on data that people are using to guide the decisions that they're making. For some organizations, the set of metrics that's out there is inaccurate and inadequate. To really understand what's happening with our workforce and what we propose in this chapter is a new set of questions and a new set of data that we think organizations should really be looking at as they want to understand what's happening with their work, with their workforce, and with their organizations. We believe that you need a different set of data and a different set of insights if you really want to make bold decisions and things that are for things that are uncertain. You need that are actually going to tell you what's going on. For example, inclusion metrics for underrepresented minorities and women in leadership positions. What if these individuals aren't in positions of influence? Are we actually asking the right questions? Are they future focused in terms of how we govern the workforce itself? There are many statistics that give you insight about what our organizations look like, but it should enable us to have a more future-oriented perspective. What are inclusion leading metrics? How do you look at the position of influence in your organization through the likes of network analysis and forward perspectives? How does this help enable you as an organization to anticipate changes and to enable you to make future-focused decisions in terms of what helps you get the best out of your workforce? Almost everybody reported the need for additional information on the workforce. 97% is an overwhelming majority. This is driving more and more expectations, more and more pressure on leaders. 53% of leaders interest in the workforce related to human, say 53% say leaders interest in workforce related information is now shifting from just an HR interest to more demand coming from the leaders themselves. As close to real time as possible is the challenge, and that's to put, that is put to the question, with only 11% being able to produce insights in real time. There's a huge gap in terms of the information that leaders want. Just over half of our leaders want more workforce information, but only 43% produce it with ad hoc or not at all. This information is mostly backward looking and more detailed views of the trends shows that there are still some backward looking questions. So let's start with making sure that we're asking the right questions. Let's look for the insights. And in the chapter itself, we have actually drafted 12 questions that are examples of the right questions to ask. It's not a comprehensive list, but it enables us to, to actually have the right conversation. So do we have an appetite for risk in, in, in the culture of our organization? And how can we sense that? How can we look at beyond diversity in terms of what's meaningful towards inclusion? How do you actually use the inclusion elements? What about the brand and evolution of the brand of our organization? Other examples include retention drivers, job evolution, workforce readiness. These provide insights into the workforce and how it's evolving. It enables us and business leaders to make better decisions. Having data insights will enable leaders to feel bolder about managing uncertainty and making decisions. In this last chapter, uh, Ethics and the Future of Work, this talks mainly about the main challenges that organizations are facing today and how we can help them think about not just what they can do, which 
with which the technology makes possible, but how they should do it to reflect the human side. So that they're grounded in principles that help them make bold decisions, but do it in a way that accounts for the ethical implications of what they're doing. This chapter is a call to action for leadership teams, calling out the types of issues that they need to start tackling. Navigating ethics in the future of work is not something that can be done by anyone other than leaders of the organization. Examples of such intersection include topics such as ghost workers from our 2019 report. There's also a common perception that a robot apocalypse is ahead of us, where robots will take over. We also have many of the discussions around data privacy of actual worker data, or whether technology made decisions are actually correct, or are they biased, since humans made the algorithm to begin with. These are some of the many questions that arise in the, at the intersection of humans and technology. Everyone's aware that there are ethical issues, and 85% of our respondents said, yeah, we believe the future of work will raise ethical challenges. But there are a couple of other challenges with this. These challenges are especially pronounced at the intersection between humans and technology, where new questions have risen to the top of the ethics agenda about the impact of emerging technologies on workers and society. Yet only 27% of our responders said that their organization has clear policies in place to address these issues. How organizations combine people and machines, govern new human machine work, combinations, and operationalize the working relationships between humans, teams, and machines will be at the center of how ethical concerns can be managed for the broadest range of benefits. Leaders must ask themselves, how should we be thinking about navigating ethical complexities and associated that with the future of work. Organizations that tackle these issues head on, changing their perspective to consider not only could we, but should we, will be well positioned to make the bold choices that help to build trust among all of their stakeholders. All of these trench chapters are what is needed to truly embed purpose and potential and perspective into your DNA. And that DNA is what's going to allow you to make the transition from being a traditional organization to a social enterprise. One that has the ability, not just to focus on the enterprise, but has the ability to focus on the ecosystem as a whole. One that has the ability, as we talked about earlier, to go from a functional way of working to a symphonic way of working. That's what's going to allow us to become not just a social enterprise, but a social enterprise at work. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, if you'd like to access this full report on the human capital trends, uh, the QRC code that's on here will get you directly there from your, from your mobile device. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd love to hear what, what your thoughts are. Jump in, Steve, if nobody else does. Um, thank you, love it. Uh, it might just be my own curiosity, but I wonder what was number 11? What was, the, what was the trend that almost got in, but thanks to some AI and some human debate, it didn't quite make it? I wish I, I, wish I knew the answer to that question. I mean, it's, there's a huge team that works on this trend report. I'm actually was the, one of the authors for just the knowledge management chapter. Nice. Um, so I don't know. I'm pleased as punch that knowledge management was <laughs> a yeah. one, made one of the nine chapters. Um, yeah. but it's a very, goes through a very extensive review and I, I wish I could tell you what the 11th one was. Uh, that's all right. Thanks though. <clears throat> yeah. I know that it's a lot of data to take in at one time. So, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Steven, this is Bill. <laughs> and I got to say, I have been a fanboy of Burson and Deloitte in this. I've been, I've been reading every trend report every year you guys came out. And, That's awesome. I, and I was very happy. And actually, I called up Tara and said, hey, look, knowledge management finally made it in. <laughs> okay. And I think one of the things that you brought up and I kind of find interesting is that, you know, this idea of code data, where we have these knowledge management uh, applications and the data just is sitting on the shelf. The knowledge is sitting on the shelf. And how are you seeing AI or are you seeing, how would you recommend AI be used to help us get it off the shelf and being used? 
So it's Other a, than just SharePoint. Yeah, it's a really great question. So, you know, I'm so spe spe specifically thinking of Microsoft, they have really created some, they're really creating some great tools in an ecosystem within um, their Azure and their React framework that allow you to start to incorporate things like Cortana and Amelia and, and, and those tools, those cognitive tools into AI. So where we see it happen in a number of ways is first around the, the passive collection of knowledge in an organization. Um, so going through and, and collecting pieces that, that are aligned to the taxonomy that can then be exposed back. So that's that concept I was talking about of making the invisible visible. The second piece around that is then using auto tagging and auto classification to make sure that it can be found by, by folks in the right way. The next piece is around the ability to drive personalization and recommendation of knowledge so that people aren't just pulling knowledge, but they're getting pushed knowledge at the point of need. So based upon the role that I'm doing in the organization, AI looking at what I'm doing, knowing who I am, knowing what my personal, my profile is, they can actually, it can recommend knowledge to me that can help me be more effective in my job and to complete a task that I have. The other is around connecting people to things and reducing the ability to, um, to reinvent the wheel all the time. So one of our clients, in the, and it's mentioned in the, in the chapter so I can talk about this, um, Phillips Medical was one of the, the clients that we, that we highlighted in our KM chapter. And I don't know if you're at uh, KM World this last year, but they presented with us. And the story that they told was very interesting, which was um, we, had, we had people that were developing these really heavy technology uh, tools for, for hospitals around, you know, and technology platform for hospitals. And we were duplicating effort in different parts of the world. We were solving the same problem. And so at, once they started to use their KM tool, they used it for, for organizing people around a project. And so as they started to define the project within the, the templates that we created for them, the AI would look for other projects that had similarities to that and say, hey, before you start down this path, let me connect you with these other people who, have, who may have already solved this problem or have a problem that, that sounds very similar to what you've already done. And so that benefits them from actually it, it uh, capitalizing on the organizational knowledge that already exists rather than continuing to reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. Um, Steve, this is Jamie. I kind of want to tag on to that question that Bill asked about AI. Um, I, I think it's great that all of these components are in this report because to, you know, together that's kind of how we, we start shifting things and, and behaviors and cultures. And, you know, I went to this conference last year and it changed my mind about having um, Alexa in my house, for example. Um, oh. I, I was completely against it because I just don't want listening devices in my home. But a person that I was listening to said, you know, um, one of the things we have to learn how to do is be thinking partners with AI. You know, how do you interact with, and I, it changed my mind completely um, because I have small children and I thought, you know, this is something I need them to understand is they need to learn how to collaborate with technology <laughs> and ask it questions and know how to shape their thoughts around how to ask the technology questions and teach the technology. So, um, and that's great because I think that they're growing up that way, but I also see a huge discomfort with people now in using that kind of technology and doing that kind of collaborative work with AI. What are some things that you think um, we can do in the workforce to, to change that comfort level in people you know, with AI, with using and engaging with things that are AI driven? So I think you, I think you really nailed, you kind of almost answered your own question, which was, which was starting with the fact that there's a distrust of AI within, you know, within our, our workplace. The, the first part of distrust is, um, is it gonna replace my job? Is it gonna replace me from doing something that I'm already doing? Will I become less valuable? And the conversation has been in the past, well, no, it will free you up and it will allow you to do more higher value things. 
And, and at the same time, organizations have said, yeah, but we're using it to take out costs in the organization. So there's this, been this kind of organizational tension between do I trust that AI is there to, to work alongside of me or do I trust that it's going to replace me? And what our report is really talking about is, and, and I think that you, you can see this if you look back to the earliest beginnings of when AI and automation was, was introduced into the workforce, it was really kind of like with the automatic teller machines. Tellers were terrified that they were going to have their jobs replaced. And they, they you know, fought against it. They organized against it. And what ended up happening was that by putting automation into the workplace, banks were actually able to open more locations and offer, create more teller jobs that did higher value things in serving the community rather than just dishing out money and taking deposits. And so it actually did increase their job. So the first thing is around this trust of, do I really trust that you're doing, you're going to do the right thing with that? The next piece is around, how do I incorporate AI as part of the team? And so that's this concept of super teams that we talked about earlier in the, in the report. And, and what we have found and what the research has found is that when people work against computers in, in a task, the computer may um, advance, they, they may do the task a little bit faster than them. But when people and computers work together on a task, it's, exponent, it's an exponential increase in the, in the output or the productivity of the output. And so that concept of people and AI working side by side together, the enhancement or augmentation of someone with AI is really the direction that we're looking at. And then the third piece I think is that ethical use of AI. And to your point, what information are they collecting about me? How are they going to use that information? You know, is it going to come back to hurt me if, it, if, if the AI reports to my boss that I'm not being as productive as the person sitting next to me? So you do have to look at the ethics of the, of the, of the technology that you're putting into place and use that as a mechanism to drive the right decisions of where you're going to partner people and machines side by side. I don't know if that answers your question. It did. Thanks. Yeah, I think it would it would help in part. I, I mean, especially when we talk about AI and how the media talks about it, there's so much focus on AI robots looking more like us, acting more like us, sounding more like us. So I think people automatically get scared of AI because they think it's it's about to come replace us, and it's it's not. You know, I mean that, and I. But I think also that you know that takes companies making an effort in terms of how they talk about it, how they incorporate it. Like, I like this concept of super teams, you know, because it's just an extension of our capabilities and enhancement of human capabilities. Um, you know, I mean, I don't want to sit there and sort through millions of records and it's completely inefficient for me to do that. But if a robot can do that, great. <laughs> and if you can use a conversational interface to ask yeah. the robot to do that, think about how much, like, you don't have to know any coding. You don't have to know how to directly answer it. You can use your natural language to do, to do that. Even if you're, and, and I don't know if you saw, um, but the Google Assistant that they've been working on for years, even if you've got broken language or you, 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 you don't, like English is not your primary language, the AI figures out what you're asking for and with the intent that you're asking for it and is able to provide you with the right answer. It's fascinating. It's actually scary, yeah. but it's fascinating. It's great. Thank you. Hi, uh, hi. Thank, I wanted to sort of follow up on that thought about um, ethical use of AI vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of the elements that the, the, the personal perception elements that you uh, listed, like sense of belonging and that, you know, those sorts of things, the perspectives, the individual's frame of mind, the individual employee's frame of mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. I foresee that this could AI could be used to be a way to behaviorally control people. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the sense that it's like, well, that employee seems sort of uh, depressed. Well, let's start, you know, manipulating them to where they feel they're not depressed. I, do you kind of get where I'm going with this? I mean, I, I know I that. Oh gosh, I hope yeah. not. I hope that's. <laughs> no, I hope that's not where we're headed. 
Well, they're, they're going, I mean, you know, more and more companies now, because they have, we have this tremendous change that it's sea change that has occurred, where so many people are going to be permanently working from home. The, and I don't know any other word to, better word to call them, the surveillance tools that companies are using are, are, are increasingly um, broadening their scope of what they're monitoring at the person there. Yeah. You know, some are monitoring eye pupil movement. Some can monitor um, physiological things like your blood pressure, your heartbeat. Um, you know, uh, you know, not to mention the the amount of time you're on the computer and all that sort of thing. Um, they're picking up ambient noise uh, in your environment. Your, you know, wherever you're working in your home, um, they can collate data about other individuals in your home. That, they, that, that again, the um, device can pick up through uh, sound or whatever and, and create a profile over time, um, just like Alexa does. So uh, I, I kind of worry about um, the, the sense of belonging, sense of this, sense of that, where at some point uh, in, the, in the interest of personal autonomy uh, and privacy, an employee, employee may very well say, look, tell me what you're, you pay me. Tell me what you're paying me for. Measure whether I produce that. End of story. And everything else, please leave in my personal realm of autonomy. Do you sense any uh, concerns about things possibly going in that direction? Well, I, I, I think that you've, I think that you touched on the title of our report, which is the paradox uh, as a path forward, right? And so um, there are there there are paradoxical tensions that exist between uh, technology in the workplace and the sense of belonging. I do. We have seen <clears throat> since the pandemic. Sorry, I have a frog in my throat. <clears throat> we have seen since the pandemic began, and people have been working from home. Uh, there's been an increase in the amount of of work that people have been doing. So discretionary effort has increased. Um, we've also seen, and either that's because people are either afraid that they're not producing enough and that they need to overproduce, or that they've got you know less commute time, and you know and it, it's un, it's unclear why that's happening. But that's one of the things. The other things that we have seen are technology that's actually being used in a positive way to monitor people. So, for example, um, looking at your calendar metadata and understanding how many breaks you have within your day. And are you, you know, are you on average spending less time uh, having breaks, which means that you're literally going from meeting to meeting to meeting. And what, is the pro what does that mean for your productivity? Um, what does it mean for your mental well-being? And so it gives you the ability to, to, to reach out and check in on an employee in a way that's intended to be positive. Now, how, to your point earlier, how companies use that data, you know, hopefully that's where this concept of ethics comes in and ethical use of data. But it, it is paradoxical. And, you know, I think, I, I wish I had the answer to the question. I mean, a lot of it is, is, is still emerging. Um, but I, I, I think that we, we have the ability to shape how our companies will use the, not, the data and the knowledge that they collect about us. Um, and, and what we have seen more than anything else is um, the rise of the employee's voice in an organization. Um, and and that's, that actually was the trend that we saw last year, that, that employees are actually getting employers to do things that they otherwise would not want to do uh, from a social contract perspective. Thank you. I appreciate those, those insights. Yep. I think we're I think we're done for for today. Um, thank you, Steve. I appreciate your your wonderful presentation. And everybody, thank you for attending today. Um, now I've I've gotten these new ideas. I was a philosophy major in college, so I think I need to start thinking about that again. Um, but um, everyone, you take care, stay healthy, and we'll see you at the next meeting in a month. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you for watching KMC DC's presentation. Hope to see you at the next monthly meeting.